Hi, I'm Steve Bowie. I'm with uh, Microsoft Security Center of Excellence, and I'm here today to talk to Ben Bernstein from the, the UAG team. Ben, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at Microsoft? Uh, yep, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a program manager for the UAG team. Uh, um, I've been here for about uh, nine years now. Uh, I've worked in all uh, sorts of uh, security-related products, uh, ISA server and uh, Forefront Security Suite, and now I'm working with the UAG and uh, I'm working on the direct access and uh, UAG integration. And I guess that's what we're going to talk about today, right? Yeah, it, it seems like your, your team has put a lot of engineering resources, time, and you know, just investment into making UAG work with direct access. What was the reason for doing that? And what, you know, what is the value prop of making these two things work together? Well, I think that uh, unification of, of uh, remote access methods on the gateway is something that uh, a lot of customers see value in. And uh, I think that direct access being uh, an innovative new uh, technology for remote access, uh, the natural place for it to be is part of the uh, UAG. Actually, uh, I think we'd be embarrassed if we'd release the UAG without the new uh, remote access technology. It doesn't seem right. So uh, we realized that it was just a natural fit uh, as part of the UAG. And I guess the UAG also has other uh, forms of remote access technologies. and. Um, I think this is a, I think it's a good match, and that's why we put a lot of effort, even though uh, some uh, concept of direct access uh, were not very, f were not, I mean, uh, were not common to other UAG, uh, uh, um, to other UAG components. I mean, we made it work together, and I think it's it's pretty natural right now, and it's it, it makes a lot of sense taking some of the uh, UAG technologies and uh, leveraging them for direct access and vice versa. So if, if I'm considering, you know, deploying direct access in my organization, uh, you know, what are the reasons I would consider deploying it with UAG? Um, so UAG is, um, in UAG we try to um, come up with a solution which is enterprise oriented. So um, the reasons that an enterprise would probably want to deploy uh, UAG as a solution is that on top of the uh, direct access technology, we add a few technologies that enable uh, smoother deployment in uh, uh, large organizations, such as uh, enabling access to uh, legacy IPv6 resources, like if you have, uh, I don't know, a Mac, uh, sorry, I'm in, in, the, in the server side, I mean, you, you have a Linux machine, you have some other form of uh, of machine that you can't just turn into, uh, it just doesn't support IPv6 uh, uh, addresses. Uh, so, for for one for um, for one reason would be that we um, we support access to such mach machines, uh, to legacy machines or uh, or even machines. If you have machines that um, have IPv4 addresses um, and they are Windows based, but you didn't, you have a large organization, you don't want to upgrade all your machines at once. Uh, so, so this is one one reason why uh, use UAG. Another reason would probably be uh, the fact that we enable scale out. Uh, the solution supports the NLB technology of Windows, and uh, it enables you to scale out and to have high availability uh, for more than one server. Uh, another reason would be, uh, I guess, the central management that we bring. Uh, UAG actually has one console where you control an entire array of servers. And this is another thing that we uh, bring to the table. So uh, from top of my mind, these are the, perhaps the three biggest uh, uh, pillars that uh, I can think of right now. But um, we also add some other um, enterprise-grade uh, uh, um, components, like uh, we integrate with SCOM, we uh, add better NAP integration, and some other stuff. Uh, so. From the top of my head, these these would be the reasons. That's quite a list. So the you know in UAG the array management the, uh, the you know the, the high availability story in UAG was real big. Will direct access be able to leverage that native technology that's native to UAG? So you're just using one monitoring and one platform. Yep, yep, yep. The, the could, answer is yes. Could you maybe you know on the whiteboard show where you know where UAG would fit into a typical corporate network? Uh, you know, you know that scenario where you have multiple UAG boxes supporting direct access. Can you show us what that would look like? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I would guess that in a typical uh, uh, deployment, you would have uh, some kind of a firewall, and that firewall would be uh, that would be your corporate firewall. Here we'll probably have the we'll probably have the internet, and on this side you would probably have a, a DMZ network. Um, 
And on the uh, on that other side, you'll probably, I guess, you would have your corporate network. Uh, we'll call it CorpNet. And you'll have uh, probably a few servers here and uh, and maybe other. I mean, it could be several networks, uh, etc. cetera. Um, the UAG would probably fit uh, naturally here on the DMZ. Uh, the, the UAG, in case you want to deploy it with uh, direct access, uh, it needs to have uh, public uh, IPv4 addresses because it leverages it, uh, IPv4 over IPv6 technology called uh, Teredo. And uh, so basically it needs to have um, a, a public IPv4 address. So you would probably need to have some kind of, uh, you can't have a NAT here, you'll have to have uh, some kind of a route uh, to the UAG. And that's, uh, I think that would be a typical deployment in a, real, um, in a real deployment. When you deploy it in the lab, I guess you don't need the whole DMZ and CorpNet part, you can just uh, deploy it straight on the edge and just have your CorpNet on one side and then have the internet on the other side. So I I'd, I'd, I'd guess you'd start with something like that, make a proof of concept, and then you just move to uh, the, the recommended deployment. So with, with UAG, if I had multiple UAGs here, would I have a, a standalone box as the array manager, like uh, in, in some of our previous products, or is um, there a different architecture? Well, basically, um, I, I only drew one box, but basically this would be a, a actually a, a set of set of boxes. Uh, they're all part of, uh, of a UAG array. One of these uh, machines, uh, we would like to call it an AMS in our language, and basically it's the one of these machines has uh, an Atom server on it, and this Atom server acts as the, um, con the central configuration uh, manager for, uh, for that array, uh, the central storage point, and um, and all the other members actually uh, take the configuration from that uh, from that central point. Uh, it, it is replicated to the other members. So if one of the um, if if one of the members is down, like the AMS, uh, you could turn the other machine into an AMS and read uh, the configuration from there. That's the UAG architecture, and DA takes advantage of it. The DA part in UAG, and actually we read the configuration from there and configure automatically all the nodes, like. Um, um, this is part of the, the central policy management. In Windows DA, uh, each member needs to have his own configuration. Here we try to automatically configure the members by pulling the configuration from the uh, AMS and uh, configuring each member. So I'm sort of simplifying the management of my direct access servers. Uh, so uh, kind of on the uh, supporting the legacy IPv4 servers, like you mentioned, uh, I believe you're using the, the NAT64 technology right. in UAG. Right. How, do, how does UAG do that? So um, let me redraw this for a second. Um, basically, we have two uh, important components on the. Suppose this is the UAG just for the <laughs> for this explanation. Uh, I know it looks like an egg, but basically it's the UAG, uh, and we'll have the NLB component. It's um, which is part of our DA offering, but just put it aside for a second. Uh, so we have uh, uh, we have DNS uh, DNS 6.4 and we have NAT 6.4. Now um, keep in mind that um, all the clients that actually access the direct access server, they're actually using uh, underneath the hood. They're using IPv6 um, IPv6 uh, 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 transport and. Um, what happens is that sometimes the corporate network only, only supports IPv4 addressing and the actual server just support IPv4 addressing. So um, suppose we have a, a server here which is IPv4. What we actually want to do with the NAT64 technology is um, to, what we actually do is open two sockets on the UAG machine. One talks IPv6 with the client. And, and that's inside an IPv4 tunnel, correct? So yeah, the client yeah. doesn't need IPv6 connectivity. It's just using that inside IPv4. Exactly. And the other, um, the other socket that we open is actually um, IPv4 socket inside the network. And we actually pump the information between one and the other. The thing is that the client thinks that it's talking with an IPv6 server, while the server thinks it's talking with an IPv4 client. 